Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm gonna completely change gears and uh, talk about something on a very like micro level, whereas Renee's talk was very macro. So uh, I'm gonna talk about beyond PowerPoint, which I realize is ridiculous in a PowerPoint. So, um, <laughs> so I, I don't typically like to use PowerPoint, but I was asked to give a talk on PowerPoint, um, not using PowerPoint, using PowerPoint. So my goal here is to basically give you some teaching ideas for wilderness medicine so that you don't need to use PowerPoint. Um, and so what I've done that gives me any credibility whatsoever to talk about this, I currently work at the University of Colorado. Um, I graduated as one of Stewart's fellows uh, from Mass General. I started the Wilderness Medicine Fellowship at CU um, and I was the director until last year. And I've also been the course director for two School of Medicine courses at the University of Colorado, Intro to and Advanced Wilderness Medicine. Um, and they are probably two of the most popular courses at CU, and I like to think that's because we don't do a lot of PowerPoint. So that's my daughter at three days old hiking in my backyard in Boulder. Um, so how can you teach wilderness medicine without using PowerPoint? Well, the good news is a lot of it um, is very amenable to other means of teaching, right? So small group sessions, case-based scenarios, games, competitions, lots of hands-on demonstrations and practice, role-playing and repetition. Personally, I'm a very kinesthetic learner. If I don't do something with my hands, I won't remember how to do it. And I honestly, I've never built a traction splint in the wilderness. I've been taught it in AWLS, I don't know how many times, but I've never actually done it, and I probably don't know that I could. But there are certain things that I've done so many times that I could do them probably blindfolded in the dark um, because I repeat them. And so I really believe that you can't have people, you can't, tell people how to build a splint out of you know, a tarp and sticks. They have to do it. They have to feel what it's like to be carried in it. And that's how you really get people to learn. So, um, so small group sessions are a great way to do that. And we are obviously building that into the plan today. It gives everyone a chance to participate. It gives people a chance to share their knowledge and impart their stories because um, Kind of as Henderson alluded to, taking care of yourself where you like to recreate is a lot of why folks do wilderness medicine. And a lot of people have stories to share about, oh, I got the bends, or I got stung by a stingray, or I got AMS. And those are the best ways to teach. So for our wilderness medicine course, what we do in order to make sure we cover all the topics is we have every day at lunchtime small group sessions where we break out into groups of about eight or nine students with a faculty member and we do cases and we read a case and we discuss the management of it and over the course of a week we get through about 60 different cases and through that we're able, we're able to cover just about every topic in wilderness medicine um, but they're small enough that people can ask focus questions and actually really discuss the cases um, so then um, other things that we really like to do using case-based scenarios, I think um, is really helpful. And so we utilize our, that's one of our emergency medicine residents lying on the ground there. And um, we basically built into our curriculum scenarios that we anticipated people might actually run into. So, um, you know, this gal said she fell out of a tree and those are our students there. And you can see we're outside, we're in Estes Park. It some years is gorgeous, it some years rains. One year it snowed so badly we had to close the course early, um, and we expect them to be able to take care of themselves. And for some students, this is you know, stuff they've done before. For some of them, they don't own camping equipment, they've never spent a night in a tent, and so they're learning wilderness skills in addition to using their wilderness medicine skills. So, um, and we, uh, the way we have it structured is such that the first week is in a mountainous environment, and we have the beauty of being in the Rocky Mountains. So and then the second week we go to Moab and we play in the desert and we do different scenarios based on the environment that we have. So we do a mass casualty scenario with a rock slide and um, those are our students um, and that's sort of a not very well built sea collar out of the Sam Splint there in the corner that you can see. Um, so games and competition I think is another kind of fun way to teach things. So the way we teach about search and rescue is to not discuss principles of search and rescue, which you can totally geek out on and it's really fun, but we basically give them a scenario. And so this is a, an example of what we divide our students up into teams and we say, okay, this is a Boy Scout troop. We tell them you had this many students. You started out at campsite one, 
Billy got lost going to campsite two, how do you find him? And then we sort of run through it with him and we make each group tell us what questions would you ask, what do you need to know, how do you structure your rescue teams, and they're all usually pretty different and then they learn from each other having gone through the exercise. So um, another way that we uh, kind of keep things fun is to do brackets, so which is the more deadly of the two when we go through all the way and uh, have students fill out their brackets and then we do use a little PowerPoint to just show them photos of the various creepy crawlies. But again, it's totally interactive and fun and it makes you start thinking about it in a bit of a different way. So, um, so again, hands-on teaching and learning, actually standing up and doing stuff. I think also actually being a patient is really illustrative some of the times um, when you see how some of your colleagues uh, treat you and you're a patient or what it feels like to be a patient and have people standing around you talking about you but not to you. Um, it really makes you realize how important that is to actually talk to your patients. So, we take our students up to Rocky Mountain Rescue for a field day and they get to play around with their mountain rescue equipment and get outside and that's one of the students in the litter there um, and they're wheeling each other around. Um, we have, for our residency program, tried to utilize our faculty and basically anyone that we can to help us do outdoor field skills days. So our residents have told us we want less didactics, we want more skills and so, um, we did a high angle rescue teaching day and it was the, basically one of our residents' brother was a climbing ranger at Rocky Mountain National Park. So in exchange for me going up there and giving their rangers a lecture on high altitude illness, he came and did a high angle teaching um, day with our students and so, or with our residents. And so that's a way that you can sort of do a little quid pro quo to get skills teaching um, for folks. Um, I had a fellow that was interested in dive medicine and so we spent a week basically at a chamber in Honduras learning about dive medicine. That's her inside the chamber down there. Um, and we got to actually operate the chamber and we got to do a little bit of diving together which was pretty incredible. Um, this was another residency teaching day. It was a swift water rescue. This is in Golden, Colorado, um, just, just west of Denver. So. Um, actually getting in the water and rescuing each other as opposed to standing around talking about how you would rescue someone from swift water. Um, and then we do lots and lots of role playing and um, for the fourth year med students that come through this course, for some of them it's, um, it's, it's the first time that they've had like things go badly and we really help tell our faculty like if they're not treating you appropriately you get sicker and you like as so some of them will really ham it up this gal is one of our fourth year residents and she was supposed to have heat stroke and if they didn't cool her down she was supposed to have a seizure and she really faked it pretty well um, and you could kind of see all the students sort of standing around like, being like what, what do we do um, but it's an it's a great way to actually learn um, and you'll never forget that pretty much and so this is, um, again, part of our, our fourth year med student course in Moab and we develop our scenarios around things that we think that they should know how, how to manage as well as take care of the environmental conditions, right? So get her out of the heat and get her out of the sun, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> so we encourage all of our students um, to be a victim or a patient because, again, that can be really illustrative when you're lying on the gurney instead of at the side of it. Um, we also do a fair amount of scene safety and like annoying bystander stuff. So we'll have someone kind of play the role of the annoying family member that's like getting in your way and unbuilding your splint as you're trying to build it or asking you annoying questions. And we want the students to try to mitigate that and figure out how to like deal with that or how to deal with like someone who's not very sick but is going to get heat stroke if you leave them out there in the sun while you're dealing with the guy with the broken neck, that kind of thing. Um, it's really, really illustrative for some of them to have to stand at the head of the bed and be a team leader. Um, not all students who are, I mean, if you're going into emergency medicine, you may have had the chance to stand at the head of a bed, but when you are an intern and a code goes off and you show up and they're like, okay, you're the doctor and you're supposed to stand there and shout orders and be loud and I mean, I don't know that I had ever done that before I had to really do it. And so it's, we kind of want to give them that practice of like, you're the, you're the team leader, go, shout it out, be heard, communicate and practice that because for a lot of them it's a really good way to learn those skills that you're going to have to learn in the hospital when you're the head of the team. 
Um, and then we use all kinds of anyone that we can get, children, family members, significant others. Um, we've even had like visitors at the campground volunteer to be victims and stuff just because they thought it was cool and wanted to know what we were doing. So, um, so wilderness medicine, again, gives you a, an opportunity to talk about things like scene safety and personal safety, whether that's in a disaster, whether that's in a natural disaster, whether that's, um, you know, basically, I, I ran up to someone at a DMAT team um, thing and the guy basically rolled over and pretended that he had a gun. Now, I've never thought of that in my life about like not approaching someone down because I thought they had a gun, but these are all law enforcement guys, right? And this was a DMAT team. And he was like, that's terrible scene safety. And I was like, wow, okay. Like, I think about bears. I don't think about guns. So, but, um, so for most of us who live in a hospital environment, we don't think about that and it's important to think about it. Um, ABCs and um, actually talking to a patient. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I actually saw, I witnessed this happen in real life. A woman passed out, someone called for medical help and the gal who showed up talked to everyone standing around her and this lady was lying on the floor and no one was talking to her. And you know, someone kind of nudged me. They're like, are you going to do anything? And I was like, well, let's just, if someone just said, hey, lady, are you okay? And she opened her eyes and said she was okay, then I can walk away. And finally, after a moment, someone did. Um, but it just, um, it's just, again, it's not something that I think that um, we always teach students a really good way. So, and then doing a basic assessment over and over again until nothing is missed when you don't have the luxury of walking into a room where a patient's in a gown in a bed and they've been fully stripped for you and um, everything is visible for you. You have to look and you can't necessarily undress them. Um, and then building and practicing with what you plan to use. And so depending on where you recreate and the things that you're likely to see, you should just practice with those things over and over again so you know how to use them when you have to. Um, so again, that's litter building, um, and that's just a uh, rope litter, um, that's a tarp litter, and again, this is our med student course, um, and we just make them all carry each other and practice. We spend an entire afternoon just doing litters and splints, pretty much. Um, so we're hoping today to give you some ideas for things to do you know, outside ideally if you can, but certainly not using PowerPoint. If you have to use PowerPoint, make it fun. There are games. Um, I have an environmental medicine Jeopardy game that I use to do board review for my residents just because it's slightly more fun than just regurgitating stuff. Um, and so luckily wilderness medicine very much lends itself to non-PowerPoint based teaching, so it's not that hard. Um, there's lots of teaching modalities out there to make it really fun, memorable, and to really get the information into people's heads. So i um, happy to answer any questions. I think we're probably a, a little back on time, so I'll turn it over unless anyone has any questions.